magic voice. I want to find out who she is. She's, she's great. Hello. I am so happy that you agreed to have this uh, talk with me. Um, My so pleasure. I've known you for a long time, and I, I did not think we would be in a situation that we're in right now. And I don't think anybody did. Well, certainly no psychics did because they haven't uh, – didn't. well, if they did, they didn't tell us, and I doubt they bought any stock in Zoom or anything like that. But um, – <laughs> I am really thrilled to have you here. I'm, I'm a bit nervous too. I mean, I know you. Um, I I didn't really, I don't know. I just feel really funny about asking you questions about science and stuff like that. But um, you'll be nice, I'm sure, and, and gentle with me because I'm not saying, you know, a, a, a scientist or anything like that. So I've told everybody, hello everybody out there in Facebook and also on YouTube who will be watching this in, a, in an hour or so whenever it's uploaded to YouTube. So I am talking to Dr. Paul Offit, who is somebody I've known for many, many years from the skeptic community. He's a, um, a fant fantastic person who explains science in uh, easy to understand ways. I am not going to go into great detail about who Paul Offit is. If you, for some reason, don't know who he is, you can read his Wikipedia page. And I'm asking that you watch the video that, that um, Brian Kirby just did, the 502 communication, 502 conversations conversations yeah thank you a video that you just did with him and it was um i'm not gonna answer i'm not gonna ask any of those questions it seems silly to ask a question when when you just did a, a talk i want to know how are you doing um you know this is a crazy time and i i can't imagine that you must be overwhelmed stressed not sleeping well how are you doing? Yeah, all through. I mean, it's, it's, um, I don't think I've ever been busier with, um, you know, the, uh, was Francis, uh, Francis Collins asked me to be part of the NIH so-called active group to try and facilitate and um, coordinate uh, pharmaceutical companies to develop this vaccine. So that's been an enormous amount of time. And, um, you know, then just the, the pressures, there's just a lot of interviews to do um, to try and explain the science behind the vaccines. So I've written a couple of New York Times op-ed pieces. I just have, I have wrote a piece for JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. They wanted me to sort of summarize the five current candidate vaccines. And so that was work. It's just been a lot of <laughs> ending room. I, I, I can't even imagine. Um, and I also want to ask, have you talked to um, Dr. Stanley Plotkin lately? I just adore him. Yeah, no, he's doing great. He's, he's, he's been pushing actually for uh, human challenge trials. That's been his sort of his role in this, um, and they're, they're preparing to do the human challenge trials if the if the phase three trials, meaning twenty thousand vaccine, ten thousand placebo, if that doesn't work, if they're not able to capture enough disease in the placebo group to prove effectiveness or at least make some statement about effectiveness, then I think his idea is a great one. But in, it, it's not quite as easy as it sounds. These human challenge trials. Uh, yeah, well, he's he's amazing. I just love him. So if you tell him. You see him or talk to him again to give him my best wishes. He right, is well respected in our in our GSOW community. We we absolutely adore him. And I loved your book. <laughs> Bad advice. It, this is a terrific book, you guys. Um, uh, Dr. Offed here has written multiple books, and I have your uh, I have one book coming today. It should be here today. It's the um, uh, vac Over vaccinate. Oh, vaccinated. Yeah, that yeah was vaccinated. Like, That's a, that should be arriving today. Overkill isn't going to be here till July. I don't know why. It's, oh, it's, right? it's already out, right? It's been, it's been out since April. Yeah. Well, I guess it's out of print or something because it had they had to do another thing on it because I just checked my Amazon and yeah. they said July 10th, I think they said that I should be receiving Overkill, which is fine because I've got to be able to read these. You know, I got to have some time to read them. I even have, I just wanted to show everybody, I'm name dropping. He has signed my book. Thank you very much. <laughs> I had no idea you were the. <laughs> so, so I just lost hearing. I now. Can't oh, hear I'm you. sorry. I'm oh, sorry. My, I set, I set the book down on my little thing. Usually, it's a cat that sits on it. it. You are so funny, and I had no idea that you were this funny. Your wife, and your kids in this book are the stories you tell are <laughs> hilarious. I mean, you got to you got to hang out with uh, Stephen Colbert and Samantha B. And, I mean, you are the man who had Samantha B was laying on a table in your work, work, uh, in your work area, and you're reading a book on vaccines to her, patting her head. 
<laughs> you, you're thinking at the same time, exactly how did my career get me here? How did that happen? I, I'm waiting to uh, uh, find that video, by the way. I was trying to find it last night and I couldn't quite oh, You'll find never it. see that part of it. That never made it into the final cut. No? Just one of the many things she did. She, she was amazing. I mean, she had, um, she had two cameras and, and so that they could capture your expression so that they could sort of edit them into wherever she wanted to edit them in. But at one point she just, um, you know, they're just, she's just asking questions. Then she throws her head to her hand. She screams, what the F? runs out of the room. You know, you're, you're like, where did this come from? You're just watching her so that they could capture that expression. It's, uh, <laughs> I read nothing the in the training taught me about how to <laughs> No, I it. guess not. That wasn't taught in med school. The uh, the part where she takes a, a, a tablet of Alka-Seltzer and she's foaming at the mouth. <laughs> God. I tell you, this is great. And I think that you and your wife should do a, a, a sitcom or some kind of reality show called Honey, We Are Being Served. No, right. honey, we're being served. <laughs> was, she sounds like she's hilarious herself. So let me get past all this because I have so much that I got to get done in really, really quick time. I was fascinated by the uh, story that you told of the Indiana uh, Dan Burton Republican, who was also a Tea Party person. I read his Wikipedia page and I was just stunned, stunned. <laughs> it was an awful meeting. I mean, it's... I was so naive. You know, I was, I was subpoenaed by Dan Burton to testify in front of the committee. And the letter, the subpoena letter said, we want you to discuss, you know, what you think about the, the biological plausibility that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine could cause autism. Because on the other panel was, was Andrew Wakefield and all his sycophants. So I thought, great. I mean, I'm a vir virologist and sort of pathogenesis person. I love this stuff. I can't wait to your five minutes that they give you explain why I thought that not only did epidemiological studies show that it didn't cause MMR didn't cause autism, but why it never made biological sense that it did because I you never hear that. So mm -hmm. I prepared it, wrote it, rewrote it, rewrote it, and then after I was done giving my talk, Dan Burton looks at me and says, "You know, isn't it true that you're in the pocket of, of Merck?" It's like what? what? I mean, why did I just go through all this? I mean, the answer was no, but you know, it's just. It's just well, so you're crazy. you're not trained for this seriously, and I think that. I like that parts of the of the stories that you were telling is that you were honest. You were saying how inexperienced you were at this and how you overthought this and how it went the wrong way or went the right way. The best part of the book, the absolute best part of this book is when you say, let me explain. Let me give you an example. Because I'm not a science, I don't have a science degree. Well, I have a social science degree, but I've never used it for anything. But um just having you, you know, people, scientists, they tend to just say stuff and I guess it goes over our head, some people, and we just say, oh yeah, okay, I got that. Not wanting to appear stupid, but you give examples and you break it down and that allows us to be able to go, I get it. Okay, I get it now. Got it. I mean, you know, when they're talking about these people not wearing masks and then somebody says, do you wear a seatbelt? You know, <laughs> and you're like, Oh, yeah, that, that does kind of make sense. People wear seatbelts and they wear helmets if they're riding a motorcycle. That's a law that we've been able to do, you know, put in in some places. And people say, oh, yeah, I, I guess I kind of get that. You know, you can't scream fire in a crowded theater. But um, the story with Dan Burton made me say to myself, we have to elect more scientific, literate people in government, in all areas of government. That's just has to be or just literate people i mean that would be good <laughs> oh that's probably true well the current government okay so ta -da, i got notes so i'm just trying to get through these really quickly so one of the things i really wanted to talk to you about obviously is that i feel like we're in a hands-on deck moment it is all hands on deck and you can you can tell me if you if you think this is wrong but here's what here's my point and the real reason besides I just want to hang out and talk with you, but the real reason why I really needed to talk to you is I feel, and I wrote this down. So the tide of anti-vax pushback we have seen is going to pale in the tsunami of upcoming misinformation that we will see as we get closer to having viable treatments and vaccines with a plural. I watched your video. We have to respect our time wisely as we must inoculate the media and the public now while they can find great information written for the average non-medical reader with hyperlinks to other uh, articles where they can get more information in a place where there's no ads, no pop-ups, 
written in the language that they want to read it in with great citations, which is Wikipedia. That's where I feel like I'm at is that we need to get more great content onto Wikipedia concerning virologists, anti-vaxxers, everything we can think of that has to do even remotely with vaccines because the media is rushed, the media doesn't have the time, and they're going to try their hardest to, they're going to just completely copy Wikipedia pages. This is where I, we know the media is getting a lot of their information. Okay, I will shut up now for my rant. <laughs> you know, I think, I think you couldn't be more right. You know, you have Tony Fauci in the last couple of days said on national television that he thinks that this vaccine can be about 75% effective, meaning 75% effective at preventing moderate to severe disease, meaning keeping you out of the hospital and keeping you out of the work. So then the question was, what percentage of the population would need to be vaccinated, given the contagiousness of this disease, given the effectiveness of the vaccine, what percentage of the population would need to be vaccinated to get the R naught, you know, that so-called yeah. reproducibility index, you know, if, which is around two to three, depending on who you read, um, to get it to less than one? Because once you get it to less than one, then transmission stops. And it's the answer is yeah. about two thirds. You need to vaccinate about two thirds of the population. Now, it's probably going to be a two dose vaccine. And so you're talking about a population of 330 million people. Two thirds is more than 200 million people. And um, that's going to be a challenge. And part of the challenge, sadly, is going to be all the misinformation that's no doubt going to sur sur surround this vaccine or these vaccines. So I think it's so critical in social, the social media world to get out the best information possible because otherwise, you know, people in this country, it's, you know, this country founded on individual rights and freedoms. We don't like to be told what to do. We like to be able to not wear a mask. We like to be able to not get vaccinated because somehow we think it is our right to catch and transmit a potentially fatal infection, which it isn't. Who so thought? I think we really have to get good information out there um, to combat that. I mean, so one thing is the virus. The other thing is the bad information that surrounds the vaccine. Oh, absolutely. So one of the things that we've been doing in the GSOW project is we have been really trying to focus on vaccines over the time. But I mean, it's something we've been kind of here and there. We do a lot of pages. On, I can't tell people, I want you to write this page. I want you to write this page. I want you to work on this page. These are all volunteers. We've got about 120 people all over the world who have lives, you know, and, and taking care of their children. And, you know, they have kids at the house because they're quarantined and all, all kinds of things. We've written 51 pages concerning vaccinations that are more or less in the vaccination world. Those 51 pages have been viewed 1,000, no, 1,052,000 times. Uh, we've already written a little over 1,400 pages in, in general that we've actually written or completely rewritten. And those Wikipedia pages have, are just about to hit 65 million page views. So we know that somebody's out there reading these pages. Um, we have, one of the things that some of my editors have been really good at, Robin um, Canton, I don't know if he's on this or not watching, but he's up there in Montreal. One of the things he's been focusing on is trying to get these anti-vax groups that look like vaccine pro pro-vaccine groups getting really well-written Wikipedia pages about them so that when they are appealing to the public or the media is, you know, talking interested in them they're able to look at it and say oh wait a second you weren't what i thought you were and they have they have names like um uh i think children's health defense is one of those uh that's an anti-vax group i believe um a person's like uh del big tree that's already we we wrote that wikipedia page it's already got one hundred and seventeen thousand views the children's health defense has already had fifty thousand views yeah, that, that's robert kennedy jr yeah. Oh my gosh. Robert Kennedy. Oh Lord. Um, and on and on. So uh, we've written, you know, Stephanie Messenger's Wikipedia page, Melody's Marvelous Measles Wikipedia page. That has 73,000 views already. But if you have, my idea is, is we need to have even the anti-vaxxers who are notable enough to have a Wikipedia page. We need to have them have something so that people are able to find that information. Because I really do believe, I mean, there's a subset of people who've already drink the flavor aid and they're they're not going to change their mind but most people don't jump into it full force they they ease their way into it you know they join a mommy group or their neighbor tells them something and they just kind of oh that sounds okay and then they just kind of get into it what is it they say about the frog that is you know frog, right. instead of just thrown into the pot so um Anyway, that's what we're doing, and I'm trying to find more editors because we badly need to get this done. I really feel like everything that we think we know now, 
I mean, all the, th all the time that we feel is um, being wasted. We're, we, we need to do this now. And I'm also hoping that maybe you'll tell me, hey, Susan, you got to get on these pages <laughs> because this is where we're going. We did write the uh, uh, Every Child by Two page. That was adorable. That's great. That's great. You know, so you have a, you, the, the vaccine will probably be out by early next year, or the vaccines will be out by early next year. And then we'll have much more information about about what we can expect from this vaccine or what we can't expect from these vaccines. And, and you'll start to see what the anti-vaccine people are, are doing and saying. And that's when you know you're going to have much more information about how really to combat that. But it's, it's, this is a war that's being fought on social media. It's not being fought in the newspapers, it's not being fought in magazines, it's not being fought on TV. It's being fought in social media. For the most part, I think for the most part, the mainstream media ignores the anti-vaccine groups. I think they don't ha nearly have the clout they had 25 or 30 years ago when they were the one-stop shop for, for a parent's point of view. If you wanted a parent's point of view, you went to Barbara Lowe Fisher, who was an anti-vaccine activist, instead of going to the 90% of parents who perfectly bought into vaccines. So, but now it, it's sort of filtered down to the, so to, to, to the internet. I mean, you, so that's why you become so critical. You're gonna save lives. You're gonna save lives with your posts. <laughs> And these Wikipedia pages are going to save lives. We, we know we are changing minds. We know we are people, and he won't even know it. People come in, they read the Wikipedia page, and they, they leave, and they're like, eh, you know, I'm off to watch a cat video now. They're, 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 we can't know that we've changed their mind. We can't know how much we've influenced them because they're just getting the information. All we know is that they are, are accessing these Wikipedia pages. And I have a quick question for you that is on, um, on masks that I can't find an answer for. So a friend of mine, a youngish friend of mine in her 30s, has gone to one of these Indian casinos and, in California. And I don't know anybody who smokes. I mean, I could probably count five people on my hands that maybe I know smoke in, in the world. And so she went into this casino and I'm like, are you sure that that was really a smart thing to do? And she goes, oh, they took our temperature when we got in and everybody's wearing masks and the place is scrubbed down and they keep scrubbing you down the casino. And I said, well, do they still smoke in the casino? She says, oh yeah, yeah, lots of people smoke. And I'm thinking, if you're smoking with a mask on, are you putting the cigarette to the side of the mask? And if the smoke can get out, can't, if they have COVID, couldn't the COVID get out too? And, and don't smokers tend to cough a lot? And I mean, you know, the mask isn't supposed to protect you. It's supposed to protect the other person. And if you're coughing, I don't know, I, I just haven't found an, an answer to this question. I'm just wanted to throw that out there if you happen to know. I can't imagine how you can smoke and still sort of maintain the integrity of that mask. That doesn't make any sense. And also, I mean, smoke is irritating to the, the nose and throat. And, and anything that irritates the nose and throat tends to enhance the virulence of respiratory viruses. And even some bacterial infections like meningococcus and pneumococcus. So, so I, you know, smoke is never good. Um, so I don't, also, I mean, I've seen like pictures of like Las Vegas casinos where there's like thousands of people all crowded together, none of them were wearing masks. I just, casinos probably not the best idea, especially now. I mean, clearly we're failing now. I mean, we think we could have now 100,000 new cases a day. I mean, you have people at the CDC saying that you should worry. Oh, okay, so let me ask a couple questions real quick while I have your you have your couple minutes with you. Jason Bush asks, I have a question for the good doctor. As far as immunity is concerned, how much is passed on from generation to generation? For example, if someone was to release the Spanish flu of 1918 into today's population, would it propagate or would we need a refresh, a new, need a refresh vaccine for that virus? Yeah, I mean, what happens is, is it, I mean, you, 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 if you're exposed to the 1918, 1919 virus and live, um, you, you're immune. And, and the immunity with flu tends not to last very long, but it, probably a better example would be measles. I mean, there's like studies of like the islands, maybe in the Faroe Islands, but one of the, uh, the islands where, you know, a, a sailor comes in, introduces measles into the island, everybody gets sick, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, least, and, and the virus dies out. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't trans, it's not transmitted anymore. Then like 50 years goes by and another person bring, introduces measles. And in. so those people who hadn't been, infected the first time were still infectable, but all those people over 50 who'd been infected were, were safe. So um, you, you generally, for viruses like measles and stuff, you can be protected for the rest of your life. Flu tends to have shorter lived and incomplete protection. It's just a, 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 more, it's a more movable target as a virus. Litter Tramiel asked me to ask you, do coronaviruses have, proofreading system, have a proofreading system that makes them less likely to mutate? 
Yeah, so it's a, sing, it's a single strand RNA virus, most closely related to measles, I'm sorry, to German measles, rubella, because it's, uh, it's so-called messenger RNA as its genome. Any single strand RNA virus mutates. The question is, it's not a really, um, uh, it does not a mutating really means anything unless there's a functional difference, meaning the virus becomes more or less uh, uh, virulent, or that it, it mutates away from the vaccine, which is what you care about. There's really little evidence for that. I mean, it, it's the spike protein, it's the key protein, the spike protein attaches virus to cells. As long as you can make an antibody response to that spike protein, you're going to prevent viruses from binding to cells. And the critical thing, um, that receptor binding domain, so-called receptor binding domain on the spike protein, that doesn't seem to mutate much. So I, I don't I don't worry that this is going to be like flu, where you know the next year you have a different virus you're dealing with. It's just hard to um, it's just going to be hard to to vaccinate a a sizable portion of this population to to stop spread, and that's what it's going to take. But again, it's like people's perception of this. It, there's it's like a third of people say they'll never get this vaccine. But what people tend to do is they tend to think a vaccine is more dangerous if the virus is more dangerous. So they they think that an anthrax or Ebola vaccine is more dangerous because the virus or bacteria is so, so dangerous. But that's not a logical assumption. I think that this, this vaccine can be a safe vaccine. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Chinese have already started to vaccinate their military with their replication defective adenovirus type 5, which I I'm surprised about given sitting they've never done a phase three trial to show that the vaccine is safe. Oh, effect. wow. So we'll see how that plays out. Oh, we'll see. Um, uh, does Dr. Offit think that the vaccines for COVID will grant sterilizing immunity or? No, I, I can answer that easily. No. <laughs> no. I mean, the answer is no. Happy they can protect at a high level against moderate to severe disease. I think it'd be, it's way too much to ask that you could prevent any sort of asymptomatic reinfection or mildly symptomatic reinfection. Okay, sounds great. Uh, Leonard Chamel says, you didn't quite answer the question. I'm not sure <laughs> where it was. Do coronavirus have a proofreading system that makes them less likely to mutate? Well, the, the answer the answer, no, is the answer. Okay. I mean, no, it's Leonard, no. It's a different no. virus that mutates, but it, I don't think it's going to mutate, just like measles mutates. I mean, you can't, if you're infected with measles and somebody gets it from you, if you sequence those two strains, you'll find that there are, are small differences. But that's okay, as long as it's not, they're not functional differences. Okay, there are no leading, okay, so anybody who's writing anything in the comment section that I'm looking at on the side, I can see like the last four comments, you guys, I can't see anything past that, I can't scroll, so just, just letting you know if I didn't read your question out, it is because I can no longer see it, so sorry, you guys. Anything else out there that we really need to know, I mean, obviously, as we said, we got to elect scientifically literate people to our, um, to our governments, even our school boards. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I think that one of some of the best advice we have out there is to vote, make informed voting decisions, um, bring other people to um, uh, great, great decisions. I always have a little round table discussion. This year it'll be virtual. Whenever the ballots come out, we sit and we go through all the ballots and we discuss them and everybody has a chance to, you know, have an opinion on it. And we, we vote it out and people go to the polls with a much better, um, uh, more information about it. Um, let's see. Which current vaccine that works do you think is the most promising? Yeah, I, um, I, I like the inactivated viral vaccine approach. I think that can that can work. I mean, again, it's there are about four companies in China or four groups in China that are working with that. Um, the early data don't look pretty good. I mean, I'm a little nervous about these other, um, you know, the sort of the mRNA and the DNA and the replication mm -hmm. defective adenoviruses, and then these vector virus approaches like vesicular stomatitis virus approach. Um, you know, there, there, there's not a commercially available vaccine in the United States for any of those. So we're, so we're learning about it. I mean, you have on the one hand this bat coronavirus about, you know, about which we have know little and we've already had a few surprises. And we're going to meet that with, you know, with vaccines that have never been used commercially before. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? So, I mean, I do think we have to be humble in all this, keep our eyes open. And, and, and the, you know, the, the key thing is the phase three trial. I mean, that's as long as we do a big phase three trial, at least, you know, at some level, you can say, look, it's been tested in 20,000 people. We can rule out uncommon side effects. I mean, 20,000 people is not 20 million people. But if it's 20 million people, we may find out that there's rare side effects. But that's why we have systems like the so-called PRISM system or the uh, vaccine safety data link system to pick that up post last year. And then in terms of effectiveness, you'd like to think you can get at least 70 percent effectiveness against moderate to severe disease, you know, to keep you out of the hospital, keep you out of the morgue. That would be good that it lasts for a few years. That would be good. Um, but, you know, you're not going to know how long it's going to last until after it's already approved. 
All right. All right. So I'm almost out of time. I just want to say thank you so much again. Um, you do think that people should join my GSOW project, right? Yes. I think everybody should. I think everybody <laughs> in the world should. <laughs> That's going to be my promo. <laughs> It's so great to see you take really good care of yourself. We need to have you around and your voice around. And I hope that maybe we'll be able to have a little bit more um, conversation whenever I get through your next books. I, I really enjoyed reading them. And you guys, you got to read them. These, he's hilarious. He is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. All right. I Thank you all. You. I'll see Bye -bye. you soon. Bye. Safe.